Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's The 42 Rugby Weekly. Gavin Casey here, joined as always by Bernard Jackman. Bert, how are you? Good, thank you. Super. Murray Kinsella is taking a little bit of time to himself, and I think we can all agree it's well-deserved after a manic few weeks. We're looking forward to seeing Murray again next week, but parachuting in to critical acclaim, I'm pretty sure, as usual, is our colleague from The 42, Gary Doyle. Gary, how are you, and did you enjoy November? Yes, it was it was a superb. Um, I really enjoyed last weekend. Actually, Saturday in particular was was great. When you don't have to work, it's 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 all the more enjoyable. And the three matches on Saturday were were brilliant games. Particularly the the France New Zealand one. I'm sure we'll we'll get into that a bit later, Gav. But um, great great month. Thought Ireland were really impressive. They really laid down a marker, and it was interesting reading. Uh, like the London Times or the New Zealand Herald to get the take of what um, from journalists from from overseas made about Ireland's performances. And interestingly, Alex Lowe picked out Tag Furlong as the as the player of the month. Uh, in other words, the foreign player in world rugby at the minute. And that comes ahead of Furlong's uh, contract extension earlier this morning. It's no surprise you get it, given that the only thing the fella doesn't do is uh, take take kicks like you know he's a superb scrummager superb passer like for a tight head to be able to pass that subtly is is incredible so he's really skillful really powerful really good at the set piece and the only thing he doesn't do is represent Ireland in the Eurovision because he's capable of doing absolutely everything else like you know maybe you should read the 6-1 news but the man is just superb talent and he's going to be the cornerstone of this team uh, going forward certainly Certainly until the next World Cup, better team with him in it. Certainly are. Bert, is he pound for pound the best player in Ireland right now? Yeah, without a doubt. Um, well, particularly because it's, he's alone in his position. I mean, he's so far ahead of the of the rest of the tight heads. He's so important to us. I mean, you know, Doris had a phenomenal... Nearly everybody had a good November, but you could argue that there's cover in every position, um, whereas tight head, and this is no disrespect to the guys behind him, but there's a big gap. There's a there's a, probably a 25, 30% gap, and and um, that's that's down to Tyg's form and, and his ability, and he's probably going to still get better, to be honest, because um, he's still not, he's not learning to trade anymore, but tight heads in general um, still learn, you know, in, into their 30s in terms of being crafty and... Um, I think that it's a great bit of business by there, if you to be honest, and probably a great bit of business for for Tyg and his agent as well. I mean, you know, he he'd made the decision. He took a gamble to only sign for a year, you know, in an environment when pay cuts and and reductions were were all the rage. And and the reality is that the rugby market has bounced back pretty quickly and and has shown real resilience. And and speaking to some some coaches and some agents, um, you know, who are operating in the Premiership and the top fourteen. Um, you know, for the right player, the the market is as good as ever, and, and Tyke certainly is the right player. So, um, yeah, it, it's it's a great bit of business for Leinster and Ireland, and uh, yeah, and for and for Tyke, and it's a big contract for him. I think this is the one, this is probably the the one contract. You know, everyone's career, you have one contract where everything is right, um, in terms of your level of form, your experience, your age profile, etc. And and I, and I would say this is the. This is the one for for Tyg. So you know, great announcement on the back of a, a positive November. Yeah, absolutely, good news all round. We're going to look back on November naturally enough. We'll chat about the women's game against Japan as well. But we've spoken plenty about the Ireland men's team in recent weeks, particularly in the aftermath of that victory over the All Blacks. So today we'll give a bit of an assessment of some of. Ireland's Six Nations rivals, probably all four of them in all reality, ahead of the spring. And we look ahead then to the URC weekend. We need to get into Stephen Larkham's impending departure. You'll probably have heard that he has been announced as a future or the future head coach of the Brumbies. So happy for him on a personal level. But what does it mean for Munster? We'll chat to the lads about that a little bit later on. Just before we get into the nitty gritty of it, a reminder, or maybe you're hearing about it for the first time, that the 42 membership is available at a 50% discount today and over the course of this weekend and this weekend only so you can get an annual membership for 21 euro members.the42.ie if you want to check that out and uh, I'd advise that you do. Um, Birch to start with the women and we'll be talking about them I would say in a lot more detail come Six Nations time this November for them was really about signing off an era if you like 
with a couple of wins just to rediscover that bit of feel good factor for when Greg McWilliams does take the reins from next month and obviously as well about giving the right type of send off to the likes of Kira Griffin especially uh, who has put so much into the jersey now as it transpires she gave herself the right type of send off by basically rescuing them in that game in very difficult circumstances with Hannah O'Connor's red card but from McWilliams point of view from the players point of view does it feel kind of as though things are moving in the right direction again, basically, before Mike Williams himself takes the reins? Um, look, in terms of results, yes. But, you know, if we're going to uh, critique them, um, uh, uh, certainly around the performance, I think both performances were, were pretty poor, to be honest. And, and certainly we benefit from the um, the quality of the opposition. But we did get two wins. And that will, in some ways, get a smile back on, on, on the players' faces and um, hopefully make it a... A little bit easier for Graham Williams to lift their confidence and self belief. The the big challenge is going to be replacing some of those stalwarts um, and obviously increasing depth uh, across a, a host of positions. So it's still a very difficult task for Graham Williams. Um, it is fitting that you know Kira and Lindsay Pete etc. and maybe a few more. The rumor is a few more are going to hang up hang up the boots that they did get a, a send off in a winning Irish team. Um, but uh, I, I, there's a lot of work to be done. I mean, um, you know. Scotland will qualify for the World Cup, you would believe. Um, Wales have qualified already. And, you know, England, France, obviously, um, are already, are already you know, way ahead of us. So we're in a different cycle than, than them. Uh, and the challenge for us is to, is to be able to blood new talent and stay competitive, you know, while they're very much focused on a World Cup. And, and, and the, the importance of the World Cup is, is in, it keeps people like Kira Griffin, you know, Keir Griffin's equivalent in Wales and Scotland playing rugby. That's the, that's the you know the consequence of not making it. Um, it makes the coach's job harder to keep people involved in a in an amateur sport. Um, uh, and and keep give, living the levels, keep giving the levels of commitment. So there is going to be a serious, uh, how would you say, loss in terms of experience and an IP etc. Um, but Craig has got to, he, you know, he's got to deal with that and, and try and find the next Kira Griffin uh, that can be there for the next, hopefully, 40, 50 caps. Well, the three of us on this call would doubtless respect Griffin's wishes in that she wants to spend time with her family and so on. We are talking about elite sport. If you were in Greg's shoes, would you be having a word with Kira, trying to tempt her back or maybe almost making a pitch to her that it would be worthwhile sticking around if indeed he hasn't done that already to be fair he, he may have tried but i'm asking if you were the incumbent head coach is that something you'd be doing or would you give her space maybe for a few months before even thinking of something like that well look, i think the first thing to do is have a have a uh you know an off the record conversation where you find out exactly um you know what are the what are, what are the barriers to keeping her involved and then obviously um if there are things that are fixable you know you look to fix them and greg Look, Greg, Greg know, will know how important leadership is, players of her quality. So um, I'm sure he will try and have that conversation to, to see if there anything he can do to make um, make it work for everybody, you know. And it's terrible, you know, in an amateur sport that they're not able to get that balance right between able to, you know, look after your family commitments plus obviously play for your country. It's a, it's a, it's a tricky one. And I know that time is, is really important in terms of preparation. And this squad I have put a lot of time and effort in into preparing well so there's no easy solutions to that but definitely when you look at I suppose the the AIL um, and the strength and depth in Irish rugby to lose someone like her you know in her prime or coming into her prime is a is a blow and um, I'd be shocked if Craig wasn't you know um, trying to make 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 that decision um, be at least looked at by by Kira because I think she would be invaluable to him um, as he starts to build a new team Looking ahead to the spring then, finally, for the women's team, Birch, is it about re-establishing themselves or reiterating the reality, perhaps, that they are still the third best team in this competition? I know, like, difficult to make that case now in the sense that Scotland beat them and we know the World Cup isn't happening. But in terms of setting goals for McWilliams himself, for the squad, looking back at the last Six Nations, it really was just about proving themselves to be the third best team. That's not really the way they were looking at it. They wanted to go a little bit further, but I suppose speaking practically or speaking in realistic terms, is it about setting roughly the same goal? Like, it's just so hard to bridge that gap, but is there any other way of framing it from Wick Williams' point of view? Yeah, I think I think you got to frame it as in what's, what's Ireland's game model look like? I mean, what uh, areas of the game are going to be really important to them? And I, and I, and I think... 
uh, I've certainly listened uh, to people who understand the the domestic game here, and when you compare it to the domestic game in Wales, or sorry, in 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 England and France, and and Wales club game isn't in a great place, but a lot of their players are now playing in 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 uh, in the English Premiership, which is obviously a lot easier in terms of um, geography. So, effectively, you know, Wales are going to get carried by the fact that the domestic competition in England is so strong. And obviously England and France will as well. So I think Greg's going to have to look at, and he and he will look at the metrics in terms of ball and play time, skill sets, etc. That you know the two top two teams in in Northern Hemisphere um, are subject to every week, and try and get our team um, on the right track towards catching that. You know because let's be honest, they are not going to stand still as well. That, that will improve year on year. So um, I I would imagine that that will be the KPI. Um, that he he measures himself. About. Greg, from what I know of him, is a coach who who likes to play. You know, he's the Mike Cat type philosophy in terms of uh, playing. And to do that, you need to be very fit. And you need to have a good skill set. So, um, I would imagine that they'll be the two criteria that he sets a stall out around. And once you get those on the right track, you know, performance and results will will, will improve rather than saying, "No, oh, we need to be third in next year Six Nations." Well, that might be realistic, or we might be third playing a type of brand of rugby that's going to end us, going to, going to have a sixth the year after, you know? So uh, I, I'd be shocked if, it, if he's not setting out his game model first and then working backwards from that. Gary reflecting on the men's November then and specifically Argentina to begin with. Again, I don't think we need to get into it in a huge amount of detail. There was always going to be an element of calm down a week after beating the All Blacks for the third time. Argentina probably didn't pose the challenge that we anticipated they might pose at least. And it felt as though, particularly after those couple of easy missed kicks, that that game was going to get away from them very quickly. It looked like they had a foot on the plane home. And so it transpired. That being said, I was just scrolling through Twitter uh, during the first half. I wasn't at the game myself, otherwise occupied, but I was, you know, following the guys who were at the game covering it. And there was a lot of talk of the game like being a complete come down from the all backs or, or very disjointed and kind of scrappy like it wasn't really the impression of the game i got myself maybe november has just changed my perspective on rugby altogether but i thoroughly enjoyed it probably the second half is more enjoyable again do you share that sentiment or was it just a game to kind of move on from it's i mean the, the big thing that's been coming out of the players is that they're, they're striving for consistency and they've got that gap they've achieved that they've won the last eight games in a row they have scored 30 plus points in seven of those games. And the one match when they didn't reach 30 points, they got 27 when they won away to Scotland. Bear in mind, France didn't win away to Scotland the last time they went to Murrayfield. So when you put everything in context, the month has been extraordinarily successful in that they've beaten the World Cup quarter finalists by 55 points, which is the largest winning margin against a World Cup quarter finalist since 2019. They've beaten the All Blacks, but it's only happened for the third time in Ireland's history. And in addition to that, they thumped Argentina by, I think it's a record score between Ireland and Argentina. Certainly, they got an excess of 50 points. So when you're putting every, everything in context and you're looking, it was very interesting what Birch was saying earlier about uh, the gap between Tag Furlong and his backup, uh, which at this stage is Finley Bealham. I was going through just the depth chart of... Uh, of the Irish squad at the minute. And I'm of the opinion that this is the strongest we've ever had it. And that November was an example of that. So I'm looking, at the, I'm looking at the whole month rather than just last Sunday's match against Argentina. But the, the reason that I'm bringing this up was because of the late changes and the fact that Timney had to come in, et cetera, et cetera. And you're looking at the fact that when you go back to the 2015 World Cup and there was that panic when Jared Payne was out, when O'Connell was out, Sexton was out, um, Sean O'Brien, Peter O'Mahony, and then Ireland lost to Argentina. And it's the only defeat Ireland have had to Argentina since 2007, right? So at that stage, it's quite clear that there isn't a depth. And if you're going to go far in World Cups, you're going to have to have two things. One is a bit of luck. And secondly, it is strength and depth all the way down. So we take... I'm finally getting to the point here. You take the, the best the best Irish team at the minute, and you'd probably go Porter, Kelleher, Furlong, uh, Ran and Henderson in the second row, Doris, Van der Fleer, Conan in the back row, Gibson Park, Edge and out Murray at this stage, Sexton. Then you'd probably go Henshaw, Ringrose in midfield, 
Conway, Lowe and Keenan as your back three. Okay. Your second best team, you'd probably have Cian Healy, Herring, Bealham, Bird, Tang, Tideburn, O'Mahony, Timoney, Coombs. You'd have Murray and Carberry at halfback. You'd have Aggie, Farrell uh, in the centre, and then you'd have Balakun, Earls, and Zebo. Right. I'm going to go. I'm going to go way down the depth chart now. If you were in the team, right, your best team, age 23 and under. Listen to this team, right? You'd have Joyce Witcherly at loose head. You'd have Kelleher, Tom O'Toole. In your second row, you'd have Ram Bird, Tom O'Hearn. In the back row, you'd have Scott Penny, 15 tries and 25 starts for Leinster. You'd have Doris, you'd have Gavin Coombs. At halfback, you'd have Casey and Harry Byrne. And we haven't even mentioned Duke or Ben Healy for those positions yet. Then in midfield, you'd have Frawley and James Hume. And your back three would be Michael Larry. Ethan McElroy and Mac Hansen. If anyone hasn't seen Mac Hansen yet, get onto YouTube, have a good look at what he's done for Connacht this season. So what we're saying here, now we haven't even mentioned guys like Jack McGrath, Dave Heffernan, John Ryan, Jean Klein, Devin Toner, Will Connors, Reese Ruddock, Max Deegan, guys that didn't feature at all in this month. Okay? So that's your, that, the, the guys I mentioned lastly, they're probably the fourth choice team that Aaron would have at the minute. The point is this. If we go to World Cup and we get hope to get to that elusive semi-final, we're going to need depth. And we may not have it in certain positions, such as tight head particularly. Second row, once you get beyond uh, Birds and Tag Burn, it's not as brilliant as other positions. But have, I'm going to contradict myself by pointing out that Alton Delan and Finneen Richerly are, are hardly shabby players, like, you know. But when you get to the back row options, it's extraordinarily deep. When you get to halfback, it's better than people realise. When you get to the centres, again, it's better than people realise. And when you've got... And you just don't know how quickly younger players are going to develop in the next two years. Because you think of the 2018 Grand Slam, Slam team, Gav, two years prior to that, when Aaron were beaten... New Zealand and Chicago. James Rand wasn't featuring. Jacob Stockdale wasn't featuring. Dan Levy wasn't featuring. And yet, when it came to win the Grand Slam and when it came to beating New Zealand again in 2018, those guys were the key players. So it just shows in two years a lot can change. And right now, I think the Irish setup and the Irish system is working very, very efficiently. There is a succession plan for when the older players move on. And there's reason to be fairly optimistic. The one caveat to all that is that the quarterfinal draw is going to throw up Ireland against either France or New Zealand. And at this stage, who would you rather have? You know, probably Birch, we sh- probably New Zealand. Perch, we probably should have had Gary on months ago uh, <laughs> to, to have averted our panic. And set the record straight. I can almost feel the listeners at home punching the air, visualizing William Webb, Webb Ellis Cup success. If um, if Faz ever has any performance anxiety before a big game, just uh, get him a one on one with with Gaz there and go through the depth chart, and he realise, no worries. But to be fair, uh, it is obviously cause for optimism. We spent plenty of months probably bemoaning a lack of a succession plan, as far as we saw, it, particularly at out half, including very recently. Maybe that's the place to start looking at Argentina. Joey Carby was going into that game without much provincial form to speak of. Actually, probably relatively poor provincial form. How did you think he did in the circumstances? And did it allay any of your concerns about that position, particularly with an eye on World Cup or, or just future Six Nations campaigns? Yeah, look, he, he did fine. I, I don't think he was man to match. Um, but I think it was it was great. He got 80 minutes. Um I felt that he got he, he he got spooked a little bit by the rush a few times, and you know that was probably a lot harder for him because Argentina, um, Argentina defended uh, you know differently than the New Zealand and um, uh, and Japan, and that's that was always going to be the case, and it's it's going to be the case now as we become more predictable in attack, um, teams will try and find ways to shut us down, and and I think that's good for us to be able to to experience those different types of defenses. I that was probably Joey. Joey found it a little bit difficult. I thought he looked better at fullback, to be honest. Um, obviously, his goal kicking was was really good. Um, I'm still not sure is is ten his best position. Um, but look at the most important thing for him was, and he spoke about it during during November was 
that struggled to find form and he's certainly not he's not out of form he he was um he was more than adequate um you know it, it was okay, it was it was good but it wasn't like wasn't brilliant but i think you know he, he's he's highly likely to jump from being struggling for confidence to being brilliant i think it was a nice reintroduction to international rugby um, he'll go back down to Munster and feeling better about himself, and he has the potential to become, you know, a, 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 a really important player for Ireland. We probably need him to. We didn't. We need him to, um, you know, to become an important player for Ireland. The biggest challenge is going to be, he's naturally a quieter fella than than Johnny. Um, so you're, when Johnny eventually retires, you know, other people will have to be ready to uh, to take on responsibility. And I think in fairness, even with Johnny, you saw that, you saw that people stepping up to be first receiver more, ring rows, etc. Uh, uh, Keenan has become, you know, a real seasoned campaigner and, and and is in brilliant form. So I think there is a, a more shared leadership. Everyone seems to know the role a little bit better. So there's less need for Johnny to organise everybody, which will help his successor. But um, I, I still think I, I would say that the two positions that we are have the biggest discrepancy between first choice and second choice are three and ten, and you can have five, six, seven eight deep on the depth chart, but it's your three and 10 who win you uh test game. So that's, that's the, that's the, the challenge. And that's, the, that's the, that's the only worry. It's, I agree with Gary. You have to be positive. There's loads of good young players, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the reality is it's, it's three and 10 who have a huge influence on winning a test match against someone, against a tier one country. And probably we need those two boys to, to stay fit. We won't get too bogged down uh, around out half Gary and, fall foul of kind of quarterback syndrome but just to get your own thoughts on Carberry's position or his best position would you see him more so as a 10 potentially the successor to Sexton or looking at that little cameo at fullback and knowing what we know about say Stuart Lancaster where he believed Carberry would be best do you fancy him more as a 15 going forward um yeah, uh, he's he's amazing at fifteen in terms of his footwork. He's he's quite assured onto the high ball as well, and in terms of counter attacking, he does have a real eye. He's got a, he's got brilliant vision. Um, the majority of his career has been at ten. I still think Ireland's needs mean that his future is there. Uh, he wouldn't have been moved to uh, to Munster if Ireland's if New Sephora and I don't know if Schmidt had an influence on that decision, but if they didn't feel that there was a serious need for Carby to be playing week in, week out at number 10. And Bernard was spot on when he said that the depth does go deep in at number three, at number eight, but the gap between your first choice and your second choice is huge, whereas your gap between your second choice and maybe your fifth or sixth choice isn't that big at all in both positions. Um, Carberry, Ireland need Carberry at 10, unless Harry Byrne uh, really progresses in the next two years. But the problem for Harry Byrne progressing in the next two years is the fact that Leinster have so much faith in his brother, uh, who hasn't really ever let Leinster down. And then, while Sexton doesn't play that many games for Leinster, he still plays enough to to curb, uh, or sorry, to halt Harry Byrne's uh, chance of progressing so yeah Ireland need Carberry at 10 I think that's where he's going to stay with Munster anyway just just Gav and, and Gary I just want to clarify so I don't mean to um, be uh, hard on the guys behind Johnny and Tyg I just want to say that they're generational players they're once in a generation player you know they could be the greatest tight head and the greatest 10 that Ireland have ever had so the, the guys are good quality international players behind them it's just they're so good it leaves a gap yeah, Danny, I think even those players would acknowledge that, Birch, yeah. Uh, Gary, you wrote a brilliant piece on site, what was it, 10, 11 days ago, about the fact that maybe as a country, we're guilty of putting too much stock in making it beyond quarterfinals, or at least we use that as a stick with which to beat the Irish team routinely at this point. And that actually between World Cups, Ireland win quite a lot, or they do quite well, and particularly have been doing very well in the last two decades. So... Knowing what you know now, or, or knowing what you know since we uh, beat the All Blacks and, and beat Argentina over the weekend, like, would you change your mind about any of that? Like, do, do you feel as though, do you feel as though this team actually should have the capacity to go on and break that duck? Or is, I suppose, the point you were making, the duck is unimportant? Uh, what, I wouldn't say it's unimportant. Like, oh, 
obviously legacies are made in World Cup, Scav, but I think the, the general point I was making is that there's a lot more to rugby than just one match every four years. Like if, if you look at the teams that have made a World Cup semi-final and we, we have to make our mind up, would we swap what Ireland have got in the last 20, year, 20 years for what, say, Scotland have got? Like Scotland have the status of reaching a World Cup semi-final. Scotland never finished in the top two in the Six Nations this century. They're at club level, all they have to their name is one Pro 14 title uh, between all their clubs. They only have two clubs in professional rugby now. Ireland have been able to maintain four professional outfits. All four provinces have won major trophies in the last 20 years. We've got 13 of the 20 uh, Pro 14 titles to, to our name. We've got seven Huntington Cups to our name between, the, between three provinces. If you look at it from an international context, away from World Cups, Ireland have finished in the top half of the Six Nations more than any of the other five countries in the last 20 years. If you look at the fact that they've won two Grand Slams and before uh, they've won two Grand Slams this century, but in the last century they won one. They've also won two other Six Nations titles. Um, we've never beaten New Zealand until 2016. We've beaten them three times in the last five meetings. We had only one win over South Africa up until 2004. We've won six of the last ten meetings. We hadn't beaten Australia since 1979 until 2002. And we, are, we have won... Uh, what is the stat on Australia? Um, we've won five. We've beaten Australia in five of the last, in five times in the last decade. Contrast that with what Scotland have done. You know, they got to a World Cup semi final. What have they done in the last twenty years in professional rugby? Next to nothing. Argentina have been to two World Cup semi finals. Argentina have won five matches and got one draw out of forty two matches in the rugby championship. So would you swap what Irish rugby has for what Argentina has? Would you swap it for what Scotland has? You might say, okay, I'd swap it for what the Welsh have done because they have got to three World Cup semi-finals in their history. They've also won uh, their la the land share of, uh, of Six Nations titles and they've had a few Grand Slams. But they have never beaten New Zealand uh, since 1953. And in terms of their club rugby, they've had six Pro 14 titles to their name. They've done absolutely diddly squat in the Heineken Cup. So I just feel when you compare how bad Irish rugby was in the, in the last century compared to how good it has been in the last 20 years, I think that perspective is needed. I think we're doing everything right to reach a World Cup semi-final. Um, and at times they've been unlucky. Against In 2011, they were beaten by a smarter team. In 2015, they were unlucky in terms of the five injuries. And in 2019, they were outplayed. I don't think the system is wrong. Um, I just think we just it's been steady, steady progress. And at some stage, they will win a World Cup quarterfinal. And I just don't think there's a need for panic uh, down to the fact that we haven't won one so far. What are your thoughts on the bridge? Without any of the the research or stats um, that Gary has, and I take his point, I still think it's important. I think it's like an athlete, you know, you target the Olympics um, as an athlete. If you're a horse trainer, you target Cheltenham. That's the, it's the biggest show in town. So you want to, you want to achieve in that. And I don't think it's exclusive. Like, I don't think Scotland haven't achieved anything um, or haven't, haven't achieved anything because they got to work up something fine. I don't think it, it has to be um, mutually exclusive. Like I just, I just think it's good, good, good habits to to want to have it all. And and I totally understand that um, it hasn't been by 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 planning that we have failed, and there has been reasons why. But I do think for this bunch of players and this coaching staff and Irish rugby as a whole, you'd like to see it take to the next level. And it doesn't mean we can't win European Cups. It doesn't mean we can't beat the All Blacks in November. Um, it's just the next step for us, and uh, I, I do think that there will be that for this for for every generation of players who haven't made a semi final, it's a it's a regret on their career, um, and that's all it is. It's not you know we have to start target we have to start throwing Six Nations games to do it, but it should be just part of performance mindset that you know uh, we want to win it all and uh, and we chase that so. You know that's, and I don't think. The, the, look, the reality is we don't change what we do 
based around the World Cup massively anyway. Um, and uh, uh, so we are quite short term focused. Hence, we've, we've you know, uh, achieved all those things that Gary says we've achieved. Um, but I still think we should be, you know, optimistic enough or demanding enough to expect to go to another level at a World Cup. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I totally see Gary's point, but I, I still think... I still think the World Cup is is another level in terms of exposure in the world, um, and it should be just a, it, the ultimate uh, achievement for for a bunch of players. Which these lads like they haven't not done anything at the World Cup because of lack of desire or effort. It just hasn't fallen into place. And I think what you know high performance is is trying to trying to learn and adapt. And if you there's a lot of really interesting stuff from Eddie Jones over the last couple of weeks around, you know he's been to what five World Cups as a coach. Um, and what he now sees as the right preparation in terms of getting a team to win it. Obviously, he's been beaten in two finals, beaten by England in 2003 and beaten by South Africa and Japan. So um, someone like him is interesting in terms of his learnings from having been to five and being, you know, being successful at five, really, without bringing it home. Mm. Like looking at, say, say, look at the last four, right? There were... Like 2007 remains kind of shrouded in mystery, really, as to how it went so incredibly badly. You hear plenty yeah, well, of stories. I was, I was part of that uh, yeah. prep, Gav. So I, I would say, I would say the mistake there was was a strategic mistake, and it was done. It was done with the right uh, idea behind it. But effectively, the team that beat England in Croke Park were wrapped in cotton wool, and they were on a different training schedule than the than the rest of us. We the, the rest of us went to Argentina in June. Um, so hence our preseason started four weeks after them and we never really caught up and hence you know there was that that feeling of the team was picked before it went and rightly so I mean they were the best players it was just effectively there was um, there were, there were best players in March or April um, and probably would have been in September October but effectively it looked like a closed shop um, there was never that level of competition and you know it, it seems as if you know when, when when they got to the rugby they were unbe- the pl- Everybody was in unbelievable shape physically. Like there was PBs coming out um, people's ears. But when it transferred to the game, we weren't rugby fit. So um, I, I think that's part of the problem. Now, in fairness to Eddie O'Sullivan, like he ma- you make that call, you know, hmm. with the information you have. And it, it, of course, it looks logical to get an extra four weeks preseason into the into the starters you know what I mean it's not a you know it's not a bad decision just the way it backfired on, um, was, was the issue so like, I think you know the, the one about 2015 um, obviously you know there was a lot of injury so there's a depth thing had we done enough to build depth and then 2019 you know it's pretty obvious now that we had a game plan that had passed the sell by days um, and also let's be honest players weren't picked on form anymore you know, yeah. uh, that level of competition, which Joe Smith was absolutely ruthless for all his time in Irish rugby bar 2019. If you had a bad training on a Wednesday, you actually could lose your place. For the, you, know, you could pick the team on a Tuesday, you're in, and you don't know your role, you're not showing enough intensity at training on Wednesday, he would pull you out. And then suddenly in 2019, he allowed mediocre performances by the, the players, in fairness, who had gone to the well for him. You know, but again, that lack of competition um or perceived lack of competition and complacency didn't stand as well so you know like that there are the little things that you probably have to the fire has to try and learn from you know that's exactly what i was going to ask you i suppose is like and see it's common consensus basically at this point that we have almost a psychological lapse when it comes to world cup quarterfinals and we've even heard some of the players mention that i think johnny sexton said it after 2019 possibly that it had become a mental barrier and I wonder if maybe we need to change our minds about that. Because when you go through how they all went wrong, the last four, just really, while we've been decent in line with what Gary was saying earlier, they've gone wrong for completely different reasons. Like, it's not the case that you get to a quarterfinal and just completely bottle it there and then because it's a quarterfinal, because we can't get over this hurdle. It's prep. It's all of these sorts of things, intangible things that have gone wrong in advance of them in, in very different ways in nearly every one. So I wonder with Farrell, like... I'm sure he will try and do this, but would you be as well off just starting with a completely clean slate at this point? Like, and just do what you're doing. Like, almost forget yeah. about the World Cup to a degree. And then when we get closer to it, just, you know, forget about the past. Just forget about it. Like, maybe it's easier yeah, said I, than done, in fairness. No, it is easier said than done. But I think I think if the vibe is is about, um, like, let's be honest as well. Like, 2019, we went in there having had our confidence eroded 
by bad performances and losses, um, which chips away. So it's the it's the happy medium between you know getting enough wins to keep you know if you're thinking with the game plan a little bit, getting enough wins to keep that self belief confidence. How enjoyable camp is like. Let's be honest, the pressure, the pressure that the players were under um, individually from their own expectation, from their own failures in the past. By all accounts, camp wasn't relieving uh, those pressures. You know, it was very intense. It was very pressurized. So that's the stuff that Farrell, in fairness to Faz, I, I mentioned Eddie Jones. Faz is, has decent experience in World Cups as well. I mean, uh, you know, and not two unsuccessful ones, but sometimes you learn more. You know, he learned more from the pressure of being host in England 2015, being part of the, of the Japan World Cup. Um, so he, it's not like he's new to him, new to him either. He's been through you know, two World Cup cycles um, already, and this will be his this will be his third one. So, um, that's that's invaluable. Cat's been through it with Italy. Um, Paulie's been through it as as a player. You know, Simon's been through it as a player and a coach. So we we have a lot of experience there. Mick Carney's a manager has been through it. So there's enough people who've been through that cycle to hopefully assess what 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 didn't work and just change that. But I, I do think. The feel good factor of playing an, uh, a good brand of rugby, a brand of rugby that's uh, suited to the laws at the moment. You're winning. You have those highs like you had against the All Blacks uh, regularly. You know, that feeds the whole thing. The worst thing you can do, like, let's be honest, 2007, you know, it started by getting, by being poor in, in preseason games, in friendly games, and, you know, in, Draco picks up an injury in Bayonne, et cetera. So, um, you know, it's that constant reinforcement and nurture nourishment of, of, we're on the right track. That's that's half the battle. Are England on the right track, Gary? Uh, looking at what you saw over the weekend against South Africa. Oh no, um, I think England got really lucky at the weekend. South Africa, when not so much in the first half, but certainly in the second half, South Africa bossed them in the set piece and missed on characteristically missed a few kicks at goal and were the much the better team and I felt deserved to win that match. Similarly, I felt Australia deserved to, well, sorry, Australia looked like they were going to beat the Welsh until they got the, the sending off early in, or midway through the first half. Um, so I wouldn't read too much into the fact that South Africa, Australia and New Zealand lost on the same day for the first time since 2002. Ha those matches were played away from home uh, in in front of Rockets supporters who sort of let out of the house for the first time in eighteen months and were going a bit a bit mental uh, as you would do and were were creating a great atmosphere and that edged a few decisions that went went the way of um, even even the France New Zealand match. There's a few New Ze a few decisions that were a little bit sort of fifty fifty that went France's way. Although France were much more impressive winners over New Zealand than England were over South Africa or um, Wales were over the, the Aussies. England in the last year have been fairly inconsistent, Gav. Like they were poor enough in the last six nations, but then when they played France, they were really good. Um, so we, st we certainly, when you're looking ahead to next year's six nations, you're, I think they're justifiably our second favourites just ahead of Ireland because of the fixture list is a wee bit more favourable to them than it is to Ireland. We have to go to Paris and to Twickenham. England have, um, they have a tricky enough fixture list actually. They've Scotland away, then they've Italy away. I wouldn't worry too much about that. Wales at home, I think will win that easily. They've Ireland at home, which is a 50-50 game. The France away, which is a 50-50 game. The French have four 50-50 games. Ireland at home, England at home, Wales away, Scotland away. They have a poor enough record in Murrayfield. I don't think, I definitely don't think there'll be a Grand Slam next season, uh, or sorry, next year. Um, I don't think, I think France will win it, but I think if Ireland managed to win, if Ireland managed to get to four wins, I think that'll be enough for them to to win the title because they'll get, I think they'll get bonus point victories at home to the Welsh, Italians and Scots. Uh, you are looking at one hell of a tournament when this kicks mm. off because you've got five you've you've got three very good teams and you've got five good teams I think the Welsh have slipped back a bit from from a couple of years ago even though they won the tournament last year like their injury list is is pretty is pretty crippling at the minute and while PVAC has PVAC has done something different to Gatland Gatland 
wasn't shy about handing out new caps, but he tended to reserve them for the sort of end of season tour games against the likes of Tonga and Samoa. Pivac hasn't been shy about handing out new caps in the Six Nations uh, or in, in games against uh, like top top level teams like South Africa and Australia. That will pay off in two years' time. I don't think it'll pay off in next year's Six Nations. So even though they're defending champions at this stage, and they always do better in the Six Nations than they do in November internationals, I wouldn't really just looking at their fixture lists, I just can't see them winning away to Ireland, winning away to England, and I can see them slipping up at home to France. So I don't fancy their chances. The Scots have a chance of doing really well, but they still have to uh, travel to Dublin. They have to get a result at home against England and France, and that's not going to be easy for them. So it's it's just going to be a, a remarkable, remarkably exciting tournament and one that is really, really hard to pick a winner in. But at this stage, you'd probably go for the French. <laughs> to be safe. Perch, to, to zone in on England for a moment, would you share Gary's thoughts that they were a little bit fortunate against South Africa? And do they instill, instill as much fear in you as they used to, I'd say, in their pomp under Eddie Jones probably a couple of years ago? Um, yeah, they do, actually. I, 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 sorry. I see the I see the future for England being very strong. Uh, I think Eddie Jones is is rebuilding now. Um, it's interesting he came out and said um, last year's dip when they finished fifth um, was caused by um, some arrogance, some um, sense of entitlement among some of the players who've been to a World Cup who became celebrities. Um, the uh, how would you say it? The, this the, the discontent amongst the squad with the Saracens players and obviously breaking the salary cap and all that stuff just became very, very difficult to manage. So he's he's had a bit of a clear out. Um, he was going to take the captaincy off Farrell, but he, he decided to to stick with him. He's found Marcus Smith, who completely changes the way England can play. I mean, he is so he is a gifted rugby player and uh, um, he's bringing through some new blood. Uh, and I, I think England will be good. I know they got beaten up a little bit by South Africa, but everyone does. You know, everyone does. And... I don't think there's a team, even France, with the, with their power and size, won't be able to put a squeeze on, on England like that. So I, I think that I totally agree with Gary. It's going to be a brilliant Six Nations. Um, and I think there's very little between England, France uh, and Ireland. Um, and, and England are going to be back. I, I back Eddie Jones all day long. Um, I know he gets a lot of stick, but I think he's very smart. He reinvents himself. Um, he's brought some new coaches in again to, to try and give the players a different stimulus. And... They have good strength and depth, and, and some good young talent coming through. So, uh, I, I would be, I would be confident England will be back. How important is that? Just to pick up uh, upon what you were saying about bringing in new coaches, particularly with a coach like Jones, probably a vaguely similar personality or style uh, to Schmidt, even. And we kind of know that by the end of Schmidt's reign, Birch, that a lot of the players were at the end of their tether. It, it was just that it maybe was too intense all of the time and, and there wasn't enough breathing space or not enough freshness. And with Jones bringing in those guys, is he aware of his own shortcomings almost in that situation? Yeah, I think he is. And he's realised that he can't be the dictator that he was in the past. It's got to be more shared leadership. He's working hugely on leadership, on his own leadership. And he sits on a on a sub-board of, um, of Goldman Sachs in Japan and he's got some mentors in, in Japan who are trying to help him become a, a better leader, particularly with the younger generation. And actually, there's a great interview on Amazon Prime, I'm sure it's online somewhere, where Michael Cech and him sat down for 15 minutes in a park and Cech asked him some pretty, um, you know, pretty strong questions around, you know, is he a bully? Um, you know, why is it high turnover of staff? And he said, look, at, I have high standards and I hold my staff to, to task if they're not delivering those because I feel it's a... It's a real elite environment we're working in and, and some people can handle that. Steve Bortwick spent 10 years with him. Scott Weismantle spent, you know, 10 or 12 years with him at, at different times and then others don't like it. But also he said, I actually don't think it's a bad thing anyway because, you know, he said the checks, he said, our generation likes stability. We liked having Bob Dwyer for 10 years and understanding exactly what Bob Dwyer likes. But the modern generation, um, they like change. They like new voices, new ideas, like constantly... Uh, press so whether it's just PR from his point of view and he's covering up for the fact that no one can stick with him or is it actually <laughs> part of his plan I think the way Ed, look at Eddie's not afraid to to be very hard on himself and reinvent himself so I actually think he's he's probably telling the truth Would it be fair to say that France are 
justifiable favourites going into the Spring Birch based on what they produced against the All Blacks and even I don't know is it fruitless or, or maybe pointless to compare say both performances Ireland's and France's against the All Blacks like a week on from Dublin the All Blacks are probably a little bit more jaded and a little bit further home psychologically even than they were uh, when Ireland beat them but at the same time you can't take away from how impressive France looked all over the park really No I think I think it's a better win for France to be honest because the All Blacks there was there was always going to be a reaction there and to do it two weeks in a row um, you know and even where the All Blacks even where the All Blacks picked up uh, picked up the physicality after the second half we're getting back into the game um, was incredibly impressive in, in terms of how how France you know turned a corner and there's a great clip online of Galtier in the pre-match talking about um, how you know the 16th minute there's going to be a moment when the game will turn and, and if you know when Intermac picked up that ball in his dead ball area the game was very much in the All Blacks' favour. France looked out in their feet. So, again, little moments like that, like Johnny Sexton at halftime against Northampton, you know, that can give people confidence um, going forward when, when they're in a tricky time. If they see Galtier as being some kind of, you know, uh, predictor of the future, I think, you know, it, it's just going to build that belief in him. And, and there will be moments when France are going to come unstuck. But the big thing about France is, over the last two years, their ability to blood new players and going to Australia... With a second string, I think was um, a genius stroke. What stood out to you about the French, Gary, watching that game? There was one moment, uh, Gav, when New Zealand uh, were on the charge and the cut. There were eighteen points down at one point at the gap to two, and it was the usual story where questions are being asked of France in the past. They so often they didn't answer those questions, like in the twenty nineteen World Cup quarter final against Wales, who had been the better team get a stupid sending off, end up losing a match that they, they really should have won. So again, because it's France who haven't won a Six Nations title since 2010, who, you know, the sort of team that can lose to Tonga in a World Cup and then nearly win that same World Cup. And so you've got that level of inconsistency within them. But this time, uh, having been brilliant in the first half, they're being questioned and they're able to come up with the answer to that question. And how they come up with it was fairly extraordinary with uh, Roman Intimac taking the ball in his end goal area, uh, throwing a dummy, charging out from there, and then the move pretty much ends up in the opposition 22. The win a penalty, R.D. Savea gets a yellow card, if memory serves me correct, um, from that same move. Uh, Jaminek holds his nerve and he did all night like he didn't miss a kick all night and he scores a penalty and the game changes a minute later he knows gets the uh the the decisive try france win they played they played with class they played with with a bit of adventure and the, they're tough boys as well i think i think they look super like you know and it's great to have them back because they've been they've been fairly mediocre for a long time but they, they certainly you couldn't say that about them now home world cup you really, really think they could become the fifth team. Potentially, they could become the fifth team uh, to get their name carved onto the Web Ellis Cup. How do you actually stop them, Bert? I think the problem is that they're not... So, like, take Ireland, for example. We're all raving about our new attacking uh, shape, and, and, and it is really good, and there is multiple options on it. But a lot of France's tries come from t totally unorthodox... Uh, situations or individual moments are brilliant. So it, it's and they have, they have two like they have two halfbacks. Uh, Dupont could you know possibly World Cup play, World Player of the Year this year. Um, Intimac and Jolly Bear. There's a lot of people in France still think Jolly Bear is better than Intimac. And uh, now they found Jaminet, who's like a Rolls Royce of a fullback. Um, they Vakatara to come back in. Fiku and Dante had the power. It, it, it's even though they've got much more structured and more organized, there's still that. Um, level of individualism that that does make them really hard to to shut down uh, because they have threats all over the field. But look, at having said that, the pressure when you think of other um, like France have done well in World Cups, but it's usually been on the back of absolute chaos uh, and anarchy and um, you know massive levels of doubt and the players and coaches not speaking and and, and that's a technique and actually we got taught it in uh, in, in our French coaching course. It's called electroshock. So basically. Um, they actually want chaos. They they want to create a shock sometimes to get the best, to get that emotion, to get that fear and bring it to a new level. And the, the thing is about this French team now is that they're not really 
there is stability for for once. You know what I mean? The probably the the best brain in terms of French coaching is the is the head coach Galtier. He has personality issues um, in terms of you know getting on with players or it's the Glenn Hoddle. You know he 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 can't understand why a player can't do what he did or what he saw, but. They've rounded that around off by having Ibanez as a manager, by bringing Servat in, um, you know, uh, K- uh, Kazim is the forwards coach. He's a, a very good people person, or the line of coach. And then obviously they brought in a kicking coach and Sean Edwards, defense coach. So they kind of have have co- they've covered up for Galtier's weaknesses uh, by surrounding people who are strong in those areas. But then you get the the actual you know a little bit of genius and and uh, ego and charisma that Fabian brings. So, uh, look, they could easily blow up. Something could happen. I mean, uh, uh, like, obviously, there was a COVID outbreak last year, and there was all kinds of rumours um, and like, accusations, which which nearly um, dishelved the whole project. But they've got over that, and they could blow up again. But in terms of talent, um, I actually think they're quite hard to shut down. I think they're... Because a, bit, a little bit unlike Fran- uh, New Zealand, um, they can actually play play through the forwards as well. Um, so that'd be the worry about New Zealand at the moment. Their back row isn't a cohesive unit. Their second rows look tired. Um, their, their props, they're not sure who the first choice hooker is. Um, you know, the props maybe aren't as good as, you know, guys in the past, whereas France can, France could could pick, like, they, you know, they didn't have Marchand, who's outstanding, and Mao Vaca, you know, had a had a really good game, and 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 they brought on a fellow from Cast um, off the bench who isn't known. Like there's so many good hookers there. They've got four or five top end hookers, and probably to be honest, they're probably deep in every position. And that's not chance. And, and like I know Gary spoke about the depth we have, and that's it's normal. We have good depth. We have four teams. They're all well funded, and it's very strict limit on foreign players. The French, you know, four years ago changed the GIF laws. Uh, so every team now wants to play more French qualified players. They've got 14 teams um, they've got in the top 14. They've got 12 teams in Pro D2. They've got a professional feather one. It's natural they have really good depth. Um, and that's that's scary because like we've been laughing at France for years uh, at how poor they were. But they had no chance to be successful because everything was pointing in different directions. Whereas now it's all pointing towards Paris 2023. I always got the impression we were only laughing at them while we had the opportunity to do so <laughs> and that there was a revolution uh, Do you, We won't have a chance to chat about Scotland, Japan. I think we can take it as a given that Scotland will be there or thereabouts uh, in the spring. Murrayfield is going to be a tough place to go. All the usual cliches, really. And they look like they're moving vaguely in the right direction. But, Birch, would you share Gary's thoughts on Wales? Um, these six nations might be one too soon for them in terms of looking to retain their title based on some of their injuries at the moment and based on form? Or can we kind of tear up the November form book as we tend to have to with Wales? And I do think, look, at they won a Grand Slam last year, so that's um, absolute credit to them. But, uh, and, and they found a couple, they found Tame Basham uh, from, from the Dragons. He's phenomenal. He's had a massive series. Um, I think they found a long-term successor to Alan Wynne jones as a leader and Ellis Jenkins back from injury. Um, they have a load of good nines, you know, in paper, they've good tens. Um, or they have, you know, they have good tens. I just don't know. I, 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 I think they've slipped back to be honest. I, I think that eventually the lack of quality or, or investment in regional rugby is going to, um, to bite them uh, on the ass and, and Gatlin and Pivak in fairness have papered over the cracks. Um, but if you look at their under twenties over the last couple of years, there hasn't been a good generation, um, you know, there's, there's just I, I, I wonder, I wonder, have they got the strength and depth? They certainly wouldn't have anything like England, France, or or Ireland. And um, I think they, in fairness, they got lucky in last year's Six Nations with a couple of red cards, um, and and they capitalised on that, and they got lucky with a red card against Australia as well. I thought Australia were a better team with fourteen. Um, so I, yeah, I do think Wales will drop off a little bit. Uh, to be honest, and it's logical they do. It's been amazing what they've done. Um, given, as I said, uh, the amount of investment in the regional game there. Gary, it doesn't even feel like a come down, really, that we're looking into a URC weekend. Maybe past iterations of the competition would have felt a little bit anticlimactic after an unbelievable November. We're staring down the barrel of a tasty-looking clash between Leinster and Ulster. Uh, from the Ulster point of view, to begin with, you are from the province after all. Uh, how do you think Dan McFarland will be approaching this game 
considering what we've seen of these two teams in recent years, where Ulster have actually posed more questions or, or posed more challenges to Leinster than most of the other teams we've seen, and yet they haven't been quite able to, to get the job done against them. So, like, what makes this one different from Ulster's point of view if they are to get over the line? Um, I don't think... I. I don't think they'll win the game, Gav, but I think they're going to give Leinster a right rattle. Um, I've, I've been, uh, seen four of, I've been at four of Ulster's five games this season, and there's been a lot of. They haven't been, they haven't been consistent from game to game in the sense that I think it was against the Lions. Their set piece was really, really good, but the week before it wasn't. Uh, against Glasgow, their defence wasn't that great, but. Since then, it, their defence has been has been pretty impressive, which it needs to be if you're going up against Leinster. Now, I know they coughed up a lot of points against Connacht, but 14 of those points were from uh, were from intercepts. So defensively, their line speed was pretty good. But what they didn't do against Connacht uh, in the second half, Connacht had something like 75 or 73 percent territory, uh, and what Ulster didn't do was. Uh, stay in the fight essentially, and that's what that's been their Achilles heel against uh, Leinster over the last two or three years. I remember the match at Ravenhill last season when they had the lead, uh, but midway through the first half against Leinster, Leinster were down to 14 players. But once Leinster got back to the full uh, contingent, and once Leinster got in a bit of momentum. Ulster followed up one mistake with a second, with a third, with a fourth, and then Leinster got on a roll and within 10 minutes had completely changed the game from being behind, they were ahead. The year before, in the 2020 Magnus League final in the Aviva, if you can remember, James Hume got, got a really early try and put Ulster ahead, and again, you're thinking, right, this might be their day, they're playing well, they've got a bit of momentum behind them. But once, Mens once Leinster got their, their claws in, sunk their claws in, again, Ulster just weren't able to check the Leinster momentum and they weren't able to just interrupt that flow. And I don't know how you do it. Um, Birch is a coach, I'm not, so I don't, know what the, I don't know what the answer to it is. But what I do think is going to happen this weekend is I think you're going to see a reaction from Ulster to how in re in reaction to how poorly they played against Connacht, uh, I think they know that if they don't go in uh, with their A game, they're going to get sunk again. And there's there's pride involved with with professionals. They have egos, and when your ego gets bruised, you want to you want to repair it. And um, and they're going in against the Leinster team that's going to be missing a lot of players. They're not going to have Sexton. They're not going to have Gibson Park. They're not going to have Ringrose. I'd say they probably will have Robbie Henshaw. They're not going to have Furlong or Porter or Kelleher. They're not going to have James Rand. They're not going to have Conan. Um, now, the, the flip side to that is that they're going to still have a lot of really good players that are going to come in. Um, so Leinster have a depth that Ulster don't have. Uh, Ulster have gone into this season. They haven't had Henderson. Um, they haven't had McCluskey for a few games. They missed Stockdale. They missed Balakoon. And when Ulster missed th those quality of players, it hurts them more than it hurts Leinster. Um, their tight five, I think, is an issue. Uh, Sam Carter has been good, but he needs to be good for 60 minutes and not just on the park for 45, for 50. I think that will make a big difference to them. If they have Hurrying available, that will make a big difference to their set piece. Uh, Tom O'Toole has played quite well this season. Uh, Alan O'Connor didn't play well against Connacht, but has played well earlier in the year. So they need their front five to be on form to have a chance. And if they are, and if they can stay in the fight, I think, I think they're going to surprise a few people this weekend. I really do. I think it's going to be a lot closer than people expect it to be. How do you see it going, Bert? Yeah, I would agree with Gary. There has to be a backlash from Ulster. If there's not, um, there's going to be serious question marks around where they're going. Um, and I know, I, look, at, I think Dan, when he reviewed last year uh, and why they failed to to win silverware, you know, I think the Challenge Cup, not winning that was a big blow you know, because they're not going to be in that, you know, very often. Um, and I know they lost to what now turned out to be a good Leicester team. Um, but at the time, you know, they weren't really. You would have fancied Ulster uh, to win that. So, I think they apparently the focus was fitness and, you know, the the mental, the mental mistakes or the the moments that they lost. They put it down to fitness. Um, 
And, you know, that's sometimes an easy thing to put it down to. And you fix the fitness and it's still there. You know, it, it wasn't that. So that's the question mark. And I, I, I just think he got bullied by Connacht. And I know I don't disagree with Gary about line speed, but it was with the other side of the ball, I thought they were really soft. Um, and they, they got smashed back. Um, I picked out some clips I'm, I'm down there tomorrow night uh, uh, for Connacht and we're in favour of Connacht's defence in terms of being able to, to bully Ulster. So it's... It's that's the question mark for me, and I do. I think there is doubts about the front five. I think there's a doubts about the front five at at the highest level, and unfortunately, look, it's not Leinster's first choice front five, but this front five that Leinster will put out, no matter who it is, um, have been able to handle nearly everyone in the in the URC. So it's a good test for them. Um, I think they will be close. Leinster maybe, you know, a little bit lacking a little bit of cohesion coming out of a break, etc. But I still think Leinster. You know, you'd have to fancy Leinster to win. Just before we move on from that game, when you say Leinster might be lacking a little little bit of cohesion, I was thinking the same thing in the sense that you're missing so many of your frontliners. And I was thinking also, okay, Ulster have actually had most of the players who are going to be available to them at the weekend, available over the last few weeks for training. So you can go to build that way. But with the team that we anticipate Leinster putting out, or in the likelihood that it's mostly a second team, they've probably been available to Leinster as well. So like, do you think maybe that actually would help to ease that gap in cohesion? Yeah, look, obviously they, they will have been preparing together and I probably have, won't have the distraction of bringing lads back from camp but they still were on a 10 day holiday you know some guys played a bit of AIL you know I think there was an A game so it's just that it's just not a normal week Leinster can, can turn their team you know on a week to week basis and have very little drop off in performance I'm just wondering because they're coming out of a break um, is that something that may you know just get them slow out of blocks. Um, you're just trying to find reasons why Ulster can stay competitive, to be honest. You know, I, I think if, if this is a standard week and Leinster played last week, even if Ulster, you know, have a backlash, I still think Leinster pull away from them. So, but I, 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 I'd, I'd like to hope it's a competitive game. Monster beginning their tour of South Africa and I guess it's been overshadowed to a degree by the news that Stephen Larkham is set to depart at the end of the season. Gary, I guess Munster for the last few years have been looking for a consistency of personnel on their staff and possibly this, I don't know, I don't want to get too far ahead. Maybe this could have knock-on effects or, or ramifications even for retaining Razi Ra or excuse me, Johan van Gran in the sense that one of the benefits, not the only one, to retaining him would have been that you're keeping the band together, so to speak. But now we know it's, it's going to split up or it's going to lose one of its chief components. How frustrating must that be for Munster uh, to have to look for somebody again when there are probably still question marks as to how well this has gone to begin with? The idea was you have to give it more time and now I guess they're going to have to tear it up or at least there will be a little bit of adaptation required from next season. I'm not a Munster, I'm not, not a Munster man, Gav, but if, if you were a Munster man, you'd be looking at Ron Nogara and the job he's done at La Rochelle, at Paul O'Connell and the job he's done with Ireland, uh, Felix Jones with the Springboks, Mike Prendergast uh, with Racing, uh, Jerry Flannery with Harlequins. And you'll be saying, okay, we've shopped across the world and enticed top talent to come to our province. And I can see why any coach in the world would want to go to, to Toman Park when it's uh, when it's full, it's amazing. But I mean, I've been at the, the matches this year, and it's and it's had a limited capacity, and it's still been an incredible atmosphere. So you could see why any coach in the world would want to be uh, employed by that club, right? But the problem is, Larkham has got his dream job uh, back in his hometown. Uh, very good coach by all accounts, good credentials. Is he overrated? You know, what's his legacy going to be with Munster? We're told that uh, he's very popular with the players. I keep reading how good he is, but the evidence in front of my eyes in terms of their attack play, it's been it's been okay. At times, it's been very good. It was very good against Scarlets. At other times, you're looking at it and going, mm, it's not that impressive. Um but my point being, Razi, when he got the option to go home, went home. Larkin, when he gets the option to go home, went home. Munster of all these players outside, players who have got the club in the flood, and you have to wonder at what point are they, is there going to be a plan to get the band back together and to get 
because these guys have got great credentials, not just in terms of great monster men, uh, but in terms of their coaching credentials as well. Like Felix Jones has got a World Cup medal tucked, tucked, in his, tucked away in his locker. Flannery's got a premiership medal. Uh, O'Gara's got done things with La Rochelle that they've never done before in their history. So you've got to, you've got to be wondering, is this going to happen? And if it's going to happen, when it's going to happen? Well, it's probably not going to happen, Birch, while Johan van Gran is at the helm, so to speak, because at least with Ronan O'Gara and Paul O'Connell, they're going to be vying for his job if they ever do look to come back. Obviously, Felix Jones and Flannery were at Munster before they went on to respective successes. Do you think maybe with some of those former players, Bernard, that they remain too close to it, maybe? No too many people in the building still don't need the pressure, don't need the hassle of going back there and trying to, I guess, get an... I'm going to call them underperforming. If I can email me if you have a problem with it, but an underperforming province back to the heights that they scaled when they were players. Well, look, I think um, you'd imagine well, Paul and Raj would have to be his head coach. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I don't see either of them going back to. Well, Paul, look, Paul, I'm sure is loving international rugby now. He's chasing the Six Nations. He's chasing. Um, he's still able to live at home, so there's not that home thing for him. Um, he's, he's probably looking at a World Cup so I, I think he's out of, I'd imagine he's out of the equation uh, for the moment Raj obviously he's a long term contract he wouldn't go uh, look I can't see him going back as an assistant and, and also I don't see Johan trying to bring one of those back to be honest we like putting you know putting a fox in the, in the, in the hen coop um, like it, it would just be a disaster uh, and you don't see that kind of thing happening very often so the question mark now is Johan is, 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 he, is he signing you know we were led to believe they were all signing uh, you know, two months ago, um, and I'm not saying that they shouldn't sign him, but that's the the challenge. I think, I think to be honest, uh, based on our evidence, uh, Stephen probably hasn't had uh, the level of transformation with the monster attacking game that we all hope for. That's just my honest opinion. I'm not saying it's bad, um, and and we, you know, I'm not saying it's easy building attack. My cat's taken, you know two years but international level it, you know you have less time with the players as well um so that look at i don't think it's a huge loss apart from the fact that it's 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 creating instability i don't think it's a massive like when joe schmidt left leinster to go to ireland you know uh it was a huge blow he was doing unbelievable things with leinster and obviously then they went from out of connor and that didn't work so it heightened the, the loss so um for me uh, you know and I've, I've been open to this i think mike prendergast i know he's under contract but He's the fellow I'd be going for. Like during, like uh, I get quite a few coaches asking me to connect them to people, you know, so they can share and learn and discuss things. You know, uh, the amount of attack coaches that want to speak to Mike Prendergast and and use me as the as the network point just because they know I worked with him is phenomenal. And and um, why? And I, I am biased in the fact that I've worked with Mike and I know he's good, but they have watched, you know, Ina. Uh, um, Stade Francais and Racing under him and appreciate um, the level of quality in terms of what he's built and re- more importantly you know and it, Mike would admit himself it's easier with Racing because um, you know you have Finn Russell you have Vakatara you have Teddy Toma you have Imhoff etc etc but to do it with Oyana you know which is a team with a small budget um, to do it at Stade Francais when you know, the team are very much in transition. Uh, I think he's built up a, a repertoire of nine or ten years that if he wasn't Irish, you know, you'd be going, oh, he's a shoe in You know, if he was if he was somebody to be going after. So that's the that's the question. For me, he's the obvious choice. I don't know McNamara has been linked to it. And I think Noel obviously has strong credentials. But in terms of nine, ten years experience in a top league as a as an attack back coach, um, you know, Mike is the Mike's the obvious candidate, in, in my opinion. But would it be an appealing prospect for him, considering where he's working now, how things are going for him, and considering what we know of... Uh, some, uh, it's, Zebo moved from Racing or moved back from France to, to have one more go in Munster. I, I think if you've been in Munster, there's a draw there. It's a huge job. Um, like, and as I said, I, I'm not, like, I haven't any inside track on this. Uh, I know Mike's got another... Apart from the fact I know he's got another year in his contract. So maybe it's not the right time for him. But, um, you know, taking contracts out of it I think he's the he, he's the right guy in terms of what he could build there and obviously he's he's from there he's from you know he knows Limerick Rugby which I think is is important as well people might see it as being important but it is important um, in terms of rebuilding that relationship with the city 
Um, and yeah, I, I think, uh, as I said, I don't know if, if he'd take it, but um, that's that'd be up to him if he got offered it, you know. Let us know if anyone uses use the point of contact <laughs> on the DL. <laughs> Monster away to the Bulls this weekend. Gary, how do you see that one playing out very briefly? And we'll, we'll wrap on Connacht then afterwards. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting because of the, the fact that it's at altitude. Um, the, the heat as well, like you're going, you're going from uh, early, early miserable weather here to 28 degrees down there. Uh, I think th- I think the South African teams, the four of them, Gav, are going to be a lot better at home than they were away. It took them, I think they got a bit of a shock when they came into the URC. They probably underestimated European teams, um, particularly the Welsh and Italian clubs, and now they know what they're in. Um, they've had five weeks to reassess, and they've got teams on home soil, and I think you're going to see a lot more South African clubs win matches over the next few weeks. That's not necessarily to say they're going to win this weekend. Um, but the Bulls, the Bulls, uh, the Bulls haven't been impressive so far because they were the they were the most talked about of the four uh, franchises, and Connacht wiped the floor with them. They absolutely destroyed them that night in Galway. Um, oh God, it's hard to know how it's going to go. Like Munster are missing a lot of their big hitters. I think. Uh, I think it'll be, be, it's a tough one to call. I think it'll be a tough bit. I don't know. I don't know what's the short answer. Bert, in a word? Bulls. Interesting. Connacht at home then to the Ospreys. And I guess conversely to what we were saying about Ulster, Connacht, they're coming in with actual form to speak of or, or the opposite of a chip on their shoulder, if you like. Same time, Birch. Uh, they, you have to win this game. Like it'll be a tough enough outing. Ospreys obviously did well against Monster a few weeks back, but you have to win this game. Like Connacht, we're pleading for them to start putting performances together, but also wins together. This should be a winnable game. Get the job done, and then we can talk about having a bit of a season. Surely, I think this is massive for Connacht because if they don't go out and perform really well, it just feeds into this whole thing about they can raise their game against the Irish provinces, but they can't back it up. So even though they played very well against Munster. Um, you know they lost so it was easier come up with that performance against Ulster now they've had everyone tell them how good they are for the last you know three or four weeks um, and it's similar to when they were brilliant against the Bulls and the week after they were very average against the Dragons now Ospreys are um, you know they're they're a bigger club at the moment in terms of you know they're they're higher up the, the table than than the Dragons and and probably um, you know I don't think Connor are going to be shocked by what they bring but you know looking into it I think the way Ospreys play is is Connacht's kryptonite, um, and that's the challenge. Like uh, Connacht like to play fast tempo. If you look at how Ospreys beat Munster, um, they just totally squeezed them out of the game, and uh, that's a worry for me. They're very well drilled, Maul, very shrewd kicking game, um, good D, and you know a good a good scrum, and they're very well coached by Toby Boot, and he's able to t- just tinker his game plan. Um, each week he knows he doesn't have the, the the squad maybe or the power that Leinster Munster have, but what he's doing is he's he's trying to just slightly change his game plan to make you know the old Belichick one make them play left handed you know um, and that's the worry for me is that whether Connacht can can adapt to that can they have can they impose their their own game and and you know nullify what Ospreys are trying to do it's going to be fascinating I, I can't wait to see it tomorrow night. I'm really excited if Connacht can win tomorrow night. Um, you know that's a massive step forward for them, and they need to win to keep on the tail of the of the other three. I mean, uh, they you know they'll, they'll be left behind if they're not careful. So there's huge pressure on them, and I'm looking forward to seeing seeing how they step up. The bigger rivalry isn't between Connacht and uh, Munster, Leinster, and uh, Ulster. The rivalry is between Connacht and Ospreys, and Connacht and Edinburgh, and Connacht and Glasgow, because they can still they can still finish fourth in the in the conference, but they can still qualify for the playoffs and they can still qualify for the European Cup. So long as they they finish high enough up the table. Like if they finish seventh, I think they're pretty much guaranteed to be in the Champions Cup next year. Even the Lion for for the Welsh Scottish region uh, having a guaranteed presence in next year's competition. So this match this match, as you said, Gavin, is absolutely is absolutely vital for them. Like, you know, like they are behind the eight ball in the sense that if you look at the URC table at the minute, first, second and third is Leinster, Ulster and Munster. Connacht have to play those teams uh, twice. Everybody else in the league has to play them once. If you look at the Scots-Welsh 
uh, conference, they get to play Zebra uh, twice. Connacht get to play them once. Zebra have played five, lost five. I think it's minus 105 of a points differential. So it's not an even uh, playing field that they're going into. They're, they are They are up against it in that regard. But they still have matters in their own hands. They still have the opportunity to to make both the playoffs and next year's Champions Cup. And that basically comes down to nights like tomorrow night where they've got to maximise home advantage, which they didn't do last season efficiently enough. But they've got to do it this time. Finally, Bert John Connacht, hanging on to Jack Carty, which is something that we broached a few weeks ago as to whether or not they'd be able to do it or whether his head may be turned it feels like a bit of a statement of intent by him. And I'd imagine that would, I won't go as far as to say it would lift a dressing room necessarily, but it must feel somewhat reassuring for teammates to know a guy who definitely had interest and probably lucrative interest abroad believes enough in a project to stick around and try and see it out. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely massive. And I think it's a huge call by him. It's a ringing endorsement of, of what he believes Connacht can can do um and the fact that he would have negotiated that contract when he was out of the the Irish squad you know shows how much uh Connacht means to him so that's massive and that'll that'll help Willie Ryan and any friend you know convince other players who may be on the fence uh, as it goes on that you know there's there's real belief behind what they're trying to build there Magic. We won't bother with predictions in that one. It's just going to be an absolutely brilliant game. I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to another weekend of the good stuff. Gary, great to see you. Thank you. Thanks a million, Gav. And thank you as always, Birch. Thanks, guys. Thanks to everybody at home for tuning in, as always, all of the 42 members for your continued support. As I said at the top of the show, there is a 50% discount on membership at the moment. So if you want to listen to, say, Behind the Lines, where George Hamilton recently sat down with Gav Cooney, it's members.the42.ie. It's twenty euro for twenty one euro, excuse me, for the year. You also get access to Murray Kinsler and Owen Toulin on Mondays Rugby Weekly Extra, plus when Six Nations rolls around as well. That's where Gary starts to get involved in the pods. We get him on with a bit of regularity in the uh, post match reaction pods. There's loads there. Members.the42.ie if you want to check it out. Until. <sighs> I think Murray will be back on Monday. I'll check in with them, but definitely Thursday uh, we'll be back in this regular slot. So enjoy it over the weekend. Mind yourselves and take it easy.